Okay, so <coughs> uh, I'm going to be talking about something slightly different, well, definitely different than what I was doing uh, last week, uh, which is about sort of slightly more formal um, field theory constraints on effective field theories of gravity. Uh, and this is work with uh, Claudia, who's in our office there at Imperial, uh, Scott Melville, and, and uh, Shuang Young Zhou, who are all at Imperial. Okay, so quick overview is. Um, the relevance of this to, to, to this workshop is that uh, all cosmological theories we're dealing with uh, should be viewed as Wilsonian effective field theories. So typically we write them down some low energy theory. We don't necessarily know what the UV completion is. And so we, we should think of that with what we've done if we did know the UV theory, which would be a function of all, of all the fields in the system, the light fields and the heavy fields. In, in defining the low energy theory, we've assumed we've implicitly integrated out all the tree level and all the loop contributions from the heavy fields. And then we're writing down some classical low energy theory, which is a function of the light fields in the system. And the gravity itself is, is probably the lightest uh, yeah, particle, possibly. Uh, well, that's it, unless it's massive, in which case the photon. But anyway, um, uh, the lightest fields in the system. And, and we yet to compute the, the loop contributions from those guys. Now, uh, so the fact that we're dealing with effective field theories is forced on us in gravity. When we, we're not dealing with normalizable theories because we know uh, that gravity breaks down at some scale. At the very least, at the Planck scale, it breaks perturbative unitarity. So it's not a renormalizable theory. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. That just means it's an effective theory. And so we should think of the Einstein-Hilbert term as the leading term in some low energy uh, expansion in derivatives that comes from integrating out whatever is the UV physics that completes, uh, that gives us our quantum theory of gravity or our UV complete theory. Now, um, there are typically two scenarios where we imagine that the UV completion is weakly coupled or strongly coupled. So the essential difference between that is if it's weakly coupled, then what can happen is that there's maybe new physics comes in below the Planck scale. So for example, that's what occurs in weakly coupled string theory. There's another scale, which is the string scale. And new states come in that then already at the classical tree level modify the high energy behavior of the uh, tree level scattering amplitudes just at tree level that softens its behavior and re resolve these problems that you get with perturbative uh, unitarity. Or it could just be strongly coupled. And, uh, and that's the sort of old school approach where nothing happens until you hit the Planck scale. And then it all goes completely crazy and all the quantum corrections are order one. And, and then you need something more profound. Now, um, in <coughs> particularly in the context of uh, dark energy and modified gravity, uh, in the recent years, people have been looking at very different classes of effective field theories, such as Galen's, Hondesky, KS, and so on, that are somewhat non-traditional. And these are all effective field theories, so they're all non-renormalizable. They will all break down at some scale, and we have to have some kind of picture of what uh, goes on with them. So many of these models, as I say, are non-traditional and actually rely on the importance of the irrelevant operators in the system. So an operator is irrelevant just on power counting. If it scales, if the Lagrangian scales faster than energy to the four, then you have to suppress it by a positive power of, uh, of mass to get the right dimensions. And that means that it will dominate at high energies and not low energies. So the poster child example probably for this is the DBI model, which is an, just a, a special case of the P of X models that you can use for both inflation or, or, or dark energy and the effective field theory for dark energy. Um, and it relies on having the interesting phenomenology of this model relies on looking in the regime where the, um, the kinetic term here is actually, oh, that's the wrong dimension, that so should be lambda to the four, but the kinetic term is of order the naive cutoff of the effective theory. Um, that's basically when the, you can, of course, in this case, we have a weakly coupled UV completion, which, is, which makes sense. And we know we can think of this as just a probe moving in an extra dimension. The low energy effective field theory sees that because there is a nonlinear realized five dimensional Poincare symmetry, which is realized by this Lagrangian, which protects its form against quantum corrections. 
And it makes sense to talk about regions where d phi squared is order lambda 4, even though that's a naive cutoff, as long as derivatives of that are smaller than lambda 5. In other words, as long as there's additional derivative suppression of that. And another way of saying that at the level of, say, the effective field theory for dark energy or inflation is that the effective field theory for the fluctuations remain control uh, regardless of how the background arises. And the second example, uh, which is sort of a base of many of these models that we talk about, Horndensky and so on and so on, is the Galileon, where we have operators like this. Uh, and there's also a symmetry, just like in the DBI case. And the analog of that is, uh, is that in, when we go into the Weinstein region, we imagine that dd phi, which is sort of the order parameter of the system, d phi over lambda cubed, becomes order 1. And that can, uh, we, that can make sense as long as further derivatives are suppressed. And then uh, there's, a, there's a story that I discussed a bit last week for people who were here that if you go deeper into the Weinstein region, that you may be able to do a little bit better because there's a wave function renormalization from this z factor that effectively raises uh, the cutoff. Anyway, so how do we distinguish between different effective field theories, the kinds that we use uh, for cosmology? Uh, and so we could just remain agnostic and write down these theories and just check against observations. And that, that's certainly probably the right approach. Uh, but sometimes we have many theories that fit the same observations. You could restrict yourself to some given particular UV completion like string theory and ask what comes from that. But that's always really depends on the day of the week. It's subject to limited uh, current understanding. Uh, so there's other questions we can ask just at the low energy, at the level of the low energy physics is consistency questions. Is the low energy effective theory uh, consistent? And so these come in many forms. There's obvious stability quest questions like ghosts, gradient instabilities. And then there's questions like causality uh, and so on. Now the problem with causality when we're dealing with effective theories for gravity uh, that distinguishes it say from particle physics models is that uh, notions of causality and are, are, well, at least notions of the speed of light are not insensitive to field redefinitions. So for example, uh, Filippo was talking last week about how you can get the various beyond uh, Hordensky models uh, by doing a field redefinition of the metric that looks something like that. But in doing that, the speed of sound for tensors will change. So if you want to say, if you want to demand that this theory maybe has a Lorentz invariant UV completion and say, well, the speed of light should be less than one, how do I do that? Which frame do I do that in? So notions of the local speed of sound are not invariant under field redefinition. Similarly, in string theory, uh, in the string effective action, you do field redefinitions like this. And the speed of sound is not invariant under these redefinitions. So that's not necessarily a good way, good criterion is to demand that the speed of, speed of sound is less than one. So the best way to go on these things is always to look at the S matrix, because that's insensitive to field redefinitions. So one approach is to look um, what are called asymptotic superluminalities. Uh, and the picture here is that, is that basically, let's suppose we have a space which is asymptotically flat. Um, this box doesn't represent anything other than this. It's supposed to be, I, should, I guess I should have drawn a Penrose diagram or something like that, but anyway. But you have a spa space which is asymptotically flat, asymptotically Minkowski, and you have some, you send uh, a particle through some region where it scatters. Um, and what you can ask is, you don't, ask, you don't care about whether its local speed is faster or slower than the speed of light, but you ask really about the global property, about whether as you integrate it all the way out to infinity, whether it travels faster or slower than something that didn't scatter through that region but just went along uh, a straight line in the asymptotic geometry. So another way of saying that is, um, so this, this is, uh, is a nice paper by Gallen Wald making this point that uh, their criterion for causality is that we cannot sing send signals faster than what is allowed by the asymptotic causal structure. In other words, if it's asymptotic Minkowski, that sets the preferred thing. We should only ask once the once your photon has got all the way back to infinity again, has it gone faster or slower than a photon that would have uh, just traveled in the asymptotic geometry uh, alone? Sorry, yeah. Yes, I know. Well, that, that's kind of my point, yes. So, so this is a much weaker notion um, uh, of what caus causality is, yeah. So uh, what this amounts to is asking that as you go through the scattering region, uh, you pick up a phase shift, 
And you can have, there's something in, in standard textbook scattering field theory, there's something called the uh, time delay, uh, which was introduced by Eisenberg and, and Wigner, which is basically the, uh, the derivative of the phase shift with respect to energy. And you're effectively demanding that the time delay is positive so that the wave that's gone through the scattering region has taken a little longer than the wave that isn't scattered. So that's another way to phrase causality. Um, another possibility is to, is to um, um, look, you make use of the full requirements of the S matrix, in particular its, uh, its analyticity. Uh, and so these were the requ requirements that were made use of successfully in the 1950s and 1960s, which is, so if we demand that the S matrix comes from a local theory, then that puts a constraint on how the scattering amplitude grows in momentum space, uh, which is basically that it's polynomially bounded, or bounded by an exponential. And this is a, a, a rather trivial statement. So the, essentially what it's saying is if I have some scattering amplitude that's a function of momentum, uh, and deep down that would have come from some local kind of field theory where I could have done everything in real space computed retarded propagators in real space, considered scattering of a potential in real space. So for it to exist in real space, I have to be able to Fourier transform back to real space. But that requires that this thing doesn't go fa faster than a linear exponential. So it can grow like k to the 1 minus epsilon, so that this integral converges. But if it grows faster than a linear exponential, the integral won't converge. And so there's no meaning to these amplitudes in real space. Uh, so locality basically demands that this thing doesn't go faster than a linear exponential. So this is the statement. Uh, it's usually actually just stated as polynomially bounded. That you, you typically this is a polynomial, but or exponentially bounded. But that's where that's coming from. So that's really locality in the sense that the scattering amplitude can be uh, viewed as having come from a local uh, field theory where everything can be written in real space. And then there's the uh, statement of causality which you can uh, relate to analyticity of the scattering amplitude as a function of um, the Mandelstam variables. And nowadays, it's typically assumed that the entire S matrix is an analytic function in some prescribed way of the Mandelstam variables. But it was only really ever rigorously proven that the 2-2 scattering amplitude uh, at fixed momenta transfer over a certain range of momenta transfer, so that's how much momenta you scatter with, uh, is an analytic function. Um, uh, but that's all we're going to use for what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So that brings me to, to what now I call these positivity constraints, which make use of these, analyt uh, these analyticity uh, properties to put constraints on effective field theories. And let me, get to, let me give you a sort of simple uh, uh, picture of how that uh, comes about. So let's, first off, let's just think about a scalar operator O of x in Minkowski spacetime. Then we know that relativistic locality and causality tells us that the commutator of those two operators vanishes outside the light cone. Okay, that's the basic statement to locality. And we know that unitarity is going to tell us that if we uh, smooth that operator in some way that we can talk about the expectation value of the square of it, then that square must be positive, just from the positivity of the Hilbert space. So if you look in any quantum field theory textbook, it'll show that if you take these two basic assumptions together with the assumption of Lorentz invariance, then you can prove this powerful statement, the chalin uh, lehmann spectral representation. So this is just textbook quantum field theory, but is, is a wonderfully powerful statement that in this case, I'm looking at the time-ordered product of those two operators. So the analog of the Feynman propagator for those two, two operators can always be written in general, let's stick it in momentum space, so the effectively the Feynman propagator for that operator can always be written as a, a, sing a contribution that may come from a pole plus a continuum contribution that comes from integrating uh, over uh, an energy mu from 4m squared up to infinity of a spectral density and then the Feynman propagators for free particles of masses m squared equals mu. So it's a superposition of a single pole as if a single particle has been propagated plus a continuum of states. And unitarity, the positivity which is uh, in the title here, comes in the statement that that spectral density, 
is a positive quantity. So it's easy enough to prove that this quantity is implying that this quantity is a positive definite quantity. So that's how unitarity uh, comes in the two-point function. M can, be zero. M, can be m can be zero, yes, but uh, um, uh, I'm mostly going to think about m non-zero for, uh, for here. Now, that's a small lie uh, because uh, it, that's, that's the sort of initial thing you derive, but it actually turns out that typically uh, in uh, many cases, depending on what the operator is, particularly if it's a composite operator, the spectral density here grows faster, too fast that this integral doesn't converge. And then what you have to do, what in the old days, in the 60s, was called the number of subtractions, but basically it corresponds to uh, the renormalizations you use to define a composite operator. Uh, and what it basically effectively co corresponds to is you, if, if this thing grows too fast to converge, differentiate this with k, respect to k squared enough times that the integral then converges, integrate it up, and then you have some integration constants which are undetermined by this procedure, which are called the subtraction functions. So this is really the general answer. You can, uh, you, if you have enough powers of mu here on the bottom to make the integral converge, k squares to compensate that, and these subtract the subtraction polynomial is the integration constants which are undetermined. So th these are really just renormalization uh, constants. Uh, so, uh, but regardless of that, what, what that means is if I differentiate the Feynman propagator with respect to k squared enough times to remove the dependence on these subtraction functions, then you find that each integral is given of this form. Uh, and in particular, what that means is if you now evaluate that, uh, that zero, uh, the integral, all those integrals are positive. So we ha what we have is a positive requirement on all the derivatives of the two-point function. Now, this, uh, the Chell and Lehman spectral representation can also be interpreted naturally as from an analytic analyticity point of view by uh, basically thinking of k squared, the momenta squared, as a complex variable with the, the standard i epsilon that occurs in the Feynman propagator is telling you that we should think of evaluating uh, the, the physical propagator from above on the real axis. So we add a little i, this is the i epsilon here, and this is the physical value of the Feynman propagator. And then we can extend the Feynman propagator into complex momentum space here, given by the variable z. So this is the imaginary part of z and the real part of z. And so the statement of the theorem is the basically that the Feynman propagator has a pole, and then the continuum, a, a continuum of poles is a branch cut. So you have a pole and a branch cut that starts at 4m squared and out. Now, this positivity requirement, what does that mean? So it puts a constraint, effectively, on the effective field theory. Uh, so how do, in what sense? So suppose we, had, uh, we were just working at tree level in the low energy effective field theory. And we thought of these operators arising in the Lagrangian uh, with in, the, in the action, something like that, with higher derivative operators. So a typical effective field theory has an infinite number of uh, operators like that, so the all derivatives are going to kick in. So just at tree level, the Feynman propagator for that operator would look like this as a function of k squared, z is k squared, minus k squared. And so if you expand that out in powers of z, our positivity requirement, which came from the positivity of the spectral density, puts a statement that all these coefficients here in the expansion are positive quantities. So that, in turn, is then putting constraints on the signs or combinations of signs in the, of the uh, high derivative operators, or the, the, uh, or the operators in the effective field theory um, in the Lagrangian, which uh, would not have been able to be uh, guessed at from any requirements about symmetry or anything like that. So, um, okay, so that was just a sort of toy, toy example. That particular example is not so interesting uh, because um, we did that based at the level of the field correlators, which are, no, again, not s insensitive to field redefinitions. Uh, so the, the way to deal with that is to, again, run the argument at the level of the scattering amplitude. So let me think about some generic scattering amplitude. And we'll start with scalars, and I'll talk about how to do it for spins later. So imagine we're scattering two particles, A plus B, into C plus D. And I'll call that the S channel. 
And then we know um, that in uh, a relativistic theory, we expect the scattering amplitude to respect crossing symmetry, which is basically, uh, in this case, we can, we can cross uh, B and D around with each other. And there should be some non-trivial relation between the, uh, this S channel and the crossed version where B and D are dropped, which is called the U channel. So crossing symmetry says that there should be a non-trivial relationship between uh, this scattering amplitude and this scattering amplitude. And I'm going to use the standard Mandelstam variables, uh, S, T, and U, which if you've, if you've forgotten what they, they are, basically S is the center of mass energy squared, and T is the momenta uh, transfer. So the scattering amplitude is a function of those two variables, because the third variable, U, is related uh, to them. So it turns out that just, for, just in, in an analog with the chalin lehmann spectra representation, the scattering amplitude in the forward limit also can be written in this analytic form where it has a pole and a branch cut. Th in fact, this piece and this piece are exactly what we would get from the chalin lehmann spectra representation with two subtractions. Um, so that means that in the complex plane, if I think about the scattering amplitude as a function of complex momenta, I have a pole here and a branch cut just like we did before. But because of crossing symmetry, which relates the variable S and U, so under this transformation, if you do this flip, S and U switch around, and because U is 4M squared minus S, that's basically relating the positive S part of the complex plane with the negative S, so it's a reflection around 2M, S equals 2M squared, then what happens is you get a second pole at 3M squared and a branch cut going backwards. So this is the U-channel physical pole and the U-channel branch cut. This is the S-channel -channel physical pole and the S-channel branch cut. And uh, you also have that this, this spectral density, I've used the same notation, but it's a different quantity, but by the optical theorem, i.e. by unitarity, it's also positive. So the scattering amplitude has the same analyticity properties as the, uh, the two-point function, with another copy from crossing symmetry. So similarly, for the scattering amplitude, if you just subtract out those pole contributions, which is easy to do, because at a tree level you can just compute them. So if we work at tree level in the low-energy effective theory, let's just subtract out the poles and look at the remaining contribution, the contribution from spectral density. If you integrate that any number of times, you'll get an integral that looks like this. Uh, in this case, you only need two subtractions to make the integral convergent. So as long as you differentiate this respect to S at least two times, then all these integrals um, are positive. And so now this is an equivalent statement on the scattering amplitude. So how does this relate back to the statements about the Lagrangian? Uh, so this is old stuff, actually, in an Adams et al. paper, but I'm basically going to generalize this, so that's why I'm going through it uh, sort of slowly. So for example, for a P of X model, uh, for example, like DBI, the kind of things we've been hearing a lot about, uh, if you compute the scattering amplitude at tree level, just at low energy expansion, then it has a contribution that goes like S squared, looking like that. And then this positivity statement says that the double derivative of that amplitude, once you've subtracted out the poles with respect to S twice, should be given by an integral, which is positive. Uh, so in this case, it is clear that that simply is going to demand that C, this quantity C, which is in front of the S squared, is positive. And so now you see the power of this statement is that basically it's telling you that the sign in that P of X Lagrangian, the sign of the coefficient of that term, has to be positive for this effective theory to have a local Lorentz invariant UV completion. Uh, so this is uh, a pretty well-known result uh, now. So those P of X models that have seen less than zero um, don't have a UV completion. If you, if you assume weakly coupled UV completion, then in fact every one of these derivatives can be computed, every one of these is positive, and that basically corresponds to a statement about the d phi to the 6, the d phi to the 8, the d phi to the 10, etc., etc. So you have an infinite number of statements about all the derivatives uh, in that uh, Lagrangian. If you do this calculation for the pure Galileon, then what happens is that in that case, when you compute the scattering amplitude, it starts at order s cubed, not s squared. And so the s squared piece, the effect of this, the c of that, as it were, is exactly zero. Uh, 
And so, uh, because this needs to be positive definite, not zero, then uh, the argument was made in this old paper that Galileans cannot admit a local uh, Lorentz invariant ubiquitization. Now, uh, so we sort of recently went back to this a little bit and just thought, I mean, it was certainly known that if you add a defi to the four back again, so you get a little positive C piece, you can resolve that problem. Uh, but we went back to it in, the, in a slightly different context. So in fact, motivated by massive gravity, which in the decoupling limit looks like a Galilean, but the Galilean actually fundamentally arises as a massive state. So if you consider something slightly different, which is a, a Galilean with a mass term, now, that's not as daft as it seems, because naively a mass term breaks the Galilean symmetry, but in practice it doesn't, because uh, adding a mass does not, does not generate any Galilean symmetry violating terms at any powers of loops, and that is because the, uh, the vertices and the propagator are all Galilean invariant when expanded around an arbitrary background, so it doesn't spoil the special non-renormalization properties of the Galilean. It's kind of a natural thing to add in. And in this case, now if you compute this, the scattering amplitude with the pole subtracted, so I'm calling it B, is the amplitude of the pole subtracted, you get, you get a positive S squared contribution. And so then there's no immediate obstruction, at least to having a weakly coupled UV completion. So that seems a simple, simple way uh, to get out without changing any other form of the Lagrangian. Just a mass term allows you to get around that basic statement. Um, now, okay, that's, that's okay, uh, but all that was relying on the statement of the forward scattering limit. But you can do much better than that. I'm going to go over, I know it. <laughs> uh, you can do much better than that, that the uh, scattering amplitude in general is a function of two variables, S and T, and it has a partial wave expansion like that. That's just standard textbook quantum mechanics, expanded in partial waves. And unitarity actually says that the imaginary part of any of those partial waves has to be positive for all L. So that's an infinite number of statements about unitarity. So before we just used the statement that the cross section was positive, because that's what the row in the, in the forward scattering limit was related, but the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude for every partial wave is positive. So there's really an infinite, I mean, there's, there's even more consequences of unitarity than that, but we certainly have an infinite number of statements that for each partial wave, the imaginary part is positive. So can we use that in some particular way? And you can as follows, because what that tells you, if, if the imaginary part of a given partial wave is positive, given this partial wave expansion, given the properties of the Legendre polynomial, you can show that every T derivative of the imaginary part of the scattering amplitude evaluated at T equals zero is positive. Every T derivative. So that's an, again, that's an infinite number of statements. So first off, that means that the imaginary part will be positive not just in the forward limit, but all the way out, or as a function of t, uh, up to at least 4m squared, which is where the Taylor expansion uh, would, uh, would break down. Um, uh, <laughs> so that means that the previous statements that we made about the scattering, the S derivatives of the scattering amplitude will now apply away from the forward scattering limit between t equals 0 and 4m squared. But we can do better than that, because if we, know, uh, if we know these quantities as a function of t, which we do, so if you, if you take the scattering amplitude, pole subtracted, and you use the um, uh, dispersion relation you would get from analyticity, then you can re relate the s derivatives to this quantity, which we know to be positive, and then we can further differentiate it with respect to t. And doing that will do two things. It'll have a t derivative of this, which again we know to be positive. Uh, unfortunately, when we t differentiate this thing in the bottom, we get a minus sign. So the t derivative of the double s derivative of the scattering amplitude isn't automatically positive. However, uh, what we can do is we see that what comes in here looks very similar to what's here. And so we can add, if we take a combination of this term and this term, such that this piece always cancels that, we can recover another positivity statement, which is this one. So if we take a t derivative of the scattering amplitude, uh, twice differentiate respect to s, and add a combination of the non-t derivative, then we get a positive quantity. 
for some choice of scale here, and that scale is the lowest scale that enters in the integration regime uh, here. And you can repeat this process, and it turns out you can derive an infinite number of bounds on every t derivative of the scattering amplitude. And what that means is that every single s derivative and every single t derivative, so all the possible derivatives of the scattering amplitude, have some non-trivial positivity statement uh, on them. Um, so that's a, a heck of a, a lot of information. In practice, this is only really useful if you assume a weakly coupled UV completion. Because in that case, the scale m you put here is going to be the lowest scale at which loops come in, which instead of being 4m squared is going to be the uh, threshold of, for new physics in the effective theory, so essentially the cutoff of the low energy effective uh, theory, uh, lambda squared, which I call lambda here. So it's the threshold for new states. But in that case, in the case of a weakly coupled UV completion, you have an infinite number of conditions on the 2-2 scattering amplitude, not just this simple forward limit statement. So going back to the Galilean, as an example, if you use these conditions, what you find is that, if you take my massive Galilean with a cubic term and a quartic term, for example, what you find is that there's a whole range of the Galilean for which there is no analytic UV completion, uh, uh, and then there's a range which is okay, which uh, satisfies these bounds, uh, and then this is a separate region, there's a range where you couldn't have the Weinstein mechanism in these theories. Okay. So, um, that really was just warm up to a more general question because what we were interested in going is putting constraints on effective theories for gravity. In case of gravity, we know we have to have spin two particles, at least. So, for example, if we were thinking about massive gravity, uh, we want to look at the scattering of spin two particles. Can we generalize these analyticity test statements uh, to, a general, uh, to, to spin two particles? In the forward limit, it's relatively straightforward to do. Um, and certainly for spin 2, um, the Feynman's a little, little bit more subtle. And this has been used, for example, recently to put constraints on the mass parameters in massive gravity. Uh, there's a sort of finite allowed region of those parameters which satisfies the analyticity constraints. Uh, so what we were interested in doing was generalizing the non-forward scattering limit constraints uh, to the general spin case. It turns out this is horrendously complicated um, because crossing symmetry is extremely complicated for general spin scattering, far more complicated than I expected it to be. And the second thing is that it'll turn out that, um, well, we have the, when we start talking about the analyticity uh, of the scattering amplitude, uh, we actually require two things, that the imaginary part, which is the discontinuity across here, is positive. That was, that was coming from unitarity. But for the scalars, we also required the imaginary part across here was positive, both here and here. And that was true in the normal case, because for scalars, crossing symmetry is simple, so that basically the imaginary part here is related to the imaginary part of the U channel. For general spin, that's not true. Crossing is extremely complicated, and so what happens is that, the, in general, the discontinuity across here is not positive. And so because that's not positive, what you'll get in those previous formula is a sum of a positive integral plus a not obviously positive integral, and you cannot make any statement about that because they could just cancel or they could be negative, one can dominate over the other. Um, and then the final thing that makes it complicated is that the scattering amplitude for general spin has a more complicated analytic structure than that. So there's additional branch cuts uh, not included. Um, so this is actually, if you, if, so if you compute a scattering amplitude between two particles, A, B, uh, C, D, so when we're dealing with uh, particles with spin, we want to label the spins, and so we'll do it by the helicity, uh, lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, lambda D. Um, so helicity is just, it's just the component of the spin in this case, because we're thinking about uh, massive states. Uh, so, in general, we're talk this, the scattering amplitude is a function of the incoming helicities, lambda 1 and lambda 2, and actually mu 1 and mu 2 here are the, out uh, the outgoing helicities, lambda 3, lambda 4, I should choose different notation. But the scattering amplitude now, in the S channel, is a function of S and T, but it's also a function of the helicity labels. 
And the statement of crossing is this horrendous looking formula where these are Wigner matrices for the associated spin, which are a function of some angle, which is given like that with square roots in and so on and so on. And there's a complicated sun and each of the coefficients has phases, so none of these things are positive. So it's just horrendous. Um, and there are also, as I said, there are additional um, the analyticity structure for the general spin case is different. So you have uh, kinematic, you have extra on physical poles at s equals 4m squared that don't correspond to physical particles. You have extra square root STU branch cuts. So if you th the, function, the, the amplitude is a function of square root of STU, you have extra square root of minus SU branch, cut, branch cuts, all very complicated. However, it turns out um, after some time you can realize you can deal with all this. So all these extra extra branch cuts and weird singularities can be factored out, these kinematic singularities that are not associated with any physical thing, but just they, where they come from is the polarization vectors of the spinning particles. These kinematic singularities can be factored out in a particular way so that we end up taking not, we're not working with the original helicity amplitudes, but what are called regularized helicity amplitudes where you take out those uh, factors. And this, the second key thing is to make the crossing simple. We shouldn't compute sc scattering out helicity amplitudes and where we measure the spin of a particle uh, along its direction of motion, but we should work with what are called transversity amplitudes. So this is actually an old thing back in the 1960s, not particularly, I'm, I'm, go I'm going to be soon yet. <laughs> uh, the w and, and it's very simple. The idea is basically if you have scattering two particles, then you can always go, you can always put those scattering in a single plane, and then you measure the spin of the particle relative to the direction orthogonal to that scattering plane. So a very simple idea. That's why it's called transversity, because you're measuring the spin opposite to that. So we don't normally do that. You won't see that in many books, but it's something you can do. And it just corresponds to a change of basis. So we're just rotating, actually, from within the plane to out of the plane. So it's just a, a pi or pi over two, whatever it is, rotation. Just a simple change of basis. So if I call these, these T things now with the scattering amplitudes, not for individual helicities, but now for individual transversities, so we measure the spin by the transversity, then the crossings, crossing formula, the previous one, this horrendous thing here, now becomes this wonderfully simple formula. It's a direct relationship between the S channel scattering amplitude and the U channel scattering amplitude, where the transversities are flipped, um, and it's a simple overall factor that you can deal with. And so because of that, what you c at the end of a long story, what you can show is if you, take, if you take the scattering amplitude in transversity and you add the scattering amplitude in transversity with exactly the opposite transversities, and then you multiply this factor to remove these weird extra poles and extra branch cuts that shouldn't really be there, so this, is, this, this factor only comes in if you're looking at boson fermion scattering. This factor is needed to cancel additional poles. And this combination, the plus combination, is needed to remove the square root STU branch cut. If you look at this quantity, this quantity is an analytic function with the same analyticity properties as the scalar scattering amplitudes, which means that everything we said about the scalars can immediately be applied to this particular combination of the transversity scattering amplitude. Uh, the only difference is because we put this junk in front, it grows faster at, at high energies, in large momentum, so we have to do more subtractions than the normal story. But that's not a big deal. So all those positivity statements about S derivatives and T derivatives of the scattering amplitude now apply to uh, this, this quantity here. So since I've run out of time anyway, so the punchline is that we can actually generalize all these statements about positivity uh, to general spin scattering amplitudes bosons and fermions and so on, provided we work in the transversity formalism, provided we work with this particular combination uh, that has the right analytic structure. And uh, we're currently working that out, applying this directly, for example, to massive gravity and some other theories. So I'll stop there. Time for one question. <laughs>
I saw recently a paper by Arkani Hamed where he was, well, with a very nice title on scattering amplitudes for all masses, all spins. Uh, and I couldn't read it, but I think that he was making some claims on massive gravity. Uh, do you know about this? Or? Yeah, he made a statement about you can't, there's no, it shouldn't be a Higgs mechanism. No, but we, we can discuss that later. I mean, what he's, what he's done is actually very simple. It's very, I mean, it's easy to explain just in standard Lagrangian way. It's just, uh, uh, but yeah. I mean, that, that's a, um, yeah, so the arguments made about it, you take the massive scattering amplitude and you take the massless limit and then you, you ask what, what does the amplitude look like, so which we do all the time because it's effectively what's going on the decoupling limit. But it, it's, yeah, it's, not, it's nothing directly to do with these. These are kind of different arguments, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we have to, uh, to stop here and uh, we'll reconvene in about 15 minutes. Thanks a lot. Thank you.